Welcome to Brave Dynamics. This is your host, Jeremy Ao. Leadership is harder than looks. As a proven founder and Harvard MBA, I interview courageous entrepreneurs, executives, and investors every week. I also share my frontline experiences, coaching insights, and own professional development journey. If you're stepping up as a new leader, founding a startup, or venturing into the great unknown, this is the podcast for you. Louis Tingen is the co-founder and former COO of Glintz. Founded in 2013, Glintz is now the number one tech-enabled recruitment platform in Asia for employers to build successful teams. Their mission is to help all people and organizations to realize their full human potential. They were the youngest founders to have raised venture capital in Southeast Asia. They are backed by VC firms such as Monks Hill Ventures, 500 Startups, Wavemaker Partners, Golden Equita Capital, Mindworks Ventures, Fresco Capital, and Singapore Press Holdings. They have been featured on Forbes, Huffington Post, TechCrunch, Yahoo News, The Straits Times, Business Times, Today, Tech in Asia, E27, and Channel News Asia. Tingen led people operations and grew the user community from zero to 250,000 across Singapore and Indonesia, managed enterprise accounts, and led the internal human capital strategy. At the age of 15, he wrote his first research paper on predicting personality through social gaming and went on to publish 12 more human-computer interaction papers in international peer-reviewed conferences and journals. He fostered student entrepreneurship as a partner with Dorm Room Fund, associate lecturer at Nian Polytechnic, entrepreneur in residence at Entrepreneur First, and advisor to the Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship for Singapore Management University. He has worked in management consulting at Boston Consulting Group, founded and sold the web design agency Half Grand, and has been a brand strategist at Training Edge International. Tingen graduated with distinction in two years from Stanford University, majoring in management science and engineering. He was honored with Forbes 30 under 30 and Entrepreneurs 27 under 27. His hobbies are high intensity cardio and watching action movies. You can follow him at his social media profile online in our show notes. Hey, Tingen, it's so good to have you. Hey, Jeremy, thanks so much for having me on your podcast. You're just an amazing dude for so many years, and I'm so happy to see you again. Yeah, so good to catch up. It's, it's funny how now with how COVID is happening, it's so much easier to catch up and find time with each other. Like we don't even have to find where and when to meet. It's just let's hop on a Zoom call. Yeah, I still remember back in the day where people were so curious about how you got started as a leader, co-founding Glintz and dropping out of school and all of that dramatic story of we do not believe in education. We believe in <laughs> crushing it in the startup world. And parents were worried for the kids and kids were like, look at Glintz. We're going to follow Tingen in this down this path. And everyone's just like me doing this armchair commentary. So it's great to see how the company has grown so tremendously over the years and also to see your own professional development journey. Yeah, definitely. I would say just so much has changed in the past, uh, what, seven years since I started my leadership journey. Like you said, it really began with my company at Glintz. Yeah. Why don't you take us to the beginning? Tell us more about your journey. Yeah, definitely. would love to. So really, I would say my leadership journey in my mind started when I was in national service, right? And, you know, it was a time where I made some of the best friends, I would say. And these guys ended up becoming my best men, <laughs> my groomsmen crew earlier this year when I got married. The leadership journey started then because that was when I started to realize that leadership is not necessarily an issue of authority or title. And that's funny, right? Because you learn, the military is a place where that really matters. But I learned it's really about connecting with people, understanding where they are, what they come from, what their concerns are, 
and then voicing it out. So I actually had that opportunity to do that um, starting during the latter part of my national service. And that was also coincidentally when I founded Glintz together with two of my schoolmates from Hua Chong. Thinking back, it was truly that time in about 2013 where my leadership journey started, where I started to really understand what it means to, to be put responsible for a group of people, giving them a sense of direction, a sense of purpose. It started out with our friends. At first, we couldn't hire anyone, so it was just friends who were helping us out of goodwill. Then we went on to hire a few interns because that's all we could afford. And of course, as time grew by, as we raised more funds, then we started to assemble a proper full-time team. And I would say that was really how the trajectory of my leadership journey continued. After I left my company in 2017, I went back to Stanford to complete my education. And that was when my leadership journey continued on, where I had the chance to start and lead two faith-based organizations. So it's been quite a ride seeing both leadership opportunities, not just in a professional world, but out of it too. Amazing. How did you personally get started at Glintz? Take us back there. Yeah, wow. Okay, so the early days were really a matter of, it started with me and my two other schoolmates, right? We wanted to find good use to our time. And we started to look for internships at startups because after all, um, there were only startups to hire people who can work on weekends, two days a week. And one thing led to another. We realized that, hey, startups really want young people to help them out. They are always in short of manpower. But on the other hand, a lot of times, people who are in national service, people who are year one, year two undergraduates, they found it hard to find these internships. So we thought, hey, why not let's build a program to connect these two people? So imagine in the early days, it was literally two Google spreadsheets. One spreadsheet that had job candidates, another spreadsheet had job descriptions, and it was just the three of us matching them. Of course, things are much more different now. We can't do that. Glintz has more than half a million job seekers, but that was really the origins of the two Google spreadsheets. Yeah, what was it like working around that whiteboard? Well, I would say like you can imagine, right? There were just many nights where it was the three of us in that room, perhaps with one or two other interns. We were all trying to figure out what the next steps were. I think that was when, looking back, that really helped define what leadership meant to me. But it definitely did not feel like leadership at that moment. At that moment, it felt like, okay, we are all on the same boat. We're all honestly trying to figure out what is going on and what to do. So at that point, I didn't even imagine to call myself a leader because in the first place, there was no team to lead. There was nothing to lead. So it was honestly a time of uncertainty, a time of really trying to figure out what could just work. Especially our angel investors had given us our first check of $50,000. It was the first time we have seen such a huge sum of money. So really making sure that, hey, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. How do we make the best use out of it? Why is leadership so important in startups? Well, I think leadership is just absolutely critical in startups, especially, but even outside of startups. I think fundamentally, leadership is so important to me because it gives the team a reason to wake up and get out of bed. And there's really two ways that each individual can wake up each day. They can do that with excitement, with intent, knowing that they're going to do something today that brings them closer to a goal. Or they can get out and go, oh man, it's just another day, another job, another moment I need to get through. And I felt one of these moments, especially in the later days of Glitz, right, where we were all trying to figure out how to capture this wave of fresh graduates who are going to come up of the local universities. Looking at my team, we weren't sure what was the best way to go about matching it. So one evening, we were all gathered in office. We divided the whole company into two teams. One team was looking at the different companies, the different jobs that are available. And then the team was looking at the candidates. And it was like an auction. It was like a bazaar, right? So someone would say, I have a candidate with XX experience, XX skills. And then the other team would be like, I want that guy. I think that guy is suitable for my job, right? And so it was like this marketplace bidding, you know, shouting over each other. The energy was just real. And honestly, I can tell you, the experiment failed. Clearly, doing things just by manual shouting and manual assessment wasn't a very accurate way. But I'm pretty sure that that night, all of us left feeling like we did accomplish something, right? And even though it wasn't the ideal model, even though it wasn't the model that we ended up with, we all knew that, hey, I was part of something. Yes, it didn't work out, 
but it was still something. And I think that's why leadership is so important and right? making people feel that even in times where things don't work out, they are still achieving something and really growing that sense of fulfillment. Things were good and things sometimes can be tough, like you shared. What hurdles did you personally face and how did you overcome them? I think one of the biggest hurdles I ever faced, especially, I would say ever since I started the company, but even up till now, it's really dealing with ego. And I think that it's such a real struggle at times to be able to acknowledge that sometimes you've got to roll up the sleeve to do the dirty things, things that you really don't want to do. One example of that was cold calling. Right. In the early days of the company, I absolutely hated cold calls. Well, it's not to say I love cold calls now, but at least I feel like I'm okay doing it. But I could tell you, there was a time when I just left Stanford. That was in 2015. And I just gave up my scholarship. I had to pay quite a bit of damages on that. And then I'll be like, hey, I'm back here. I'm now a startup founder, a startup leader. I should not be doing cold calls. I'm better than that. <laughs> I didn't leave Stanford to do cold calls. And that's just ego speaking. But that was really one of the toughest things, right? to be able to bite my ego and do the hard thing. I also remember another time later that year, right, when we started to do sales meetings, literally one of the prospective customers asked us, hey, are you a student here doing a survey? And I was like, no, I'm actually the company trying to, to sell you a, a, a solution. And so it's just such a humbling experience. But I think it, it's a constant battle because on one hand, especially in the startup world and especially as a leader, you often get a lot of accolades. You get a lot of media attention. I think uh, one thing we both have in common is, for example, the Forbes 30 under 30 thing, which I guess perhaps to some, it sounds like, wow, that's such a great achievement, right? But honestly, some of my friends joke and tease me about that. But I think the fact that a lot of times these things really do get to my head. And, and I think just being able to recognize that, hey, honestly, that was just for the past, right? And that's behind us. Now, what matters is the present moment and the moments going forward. So yeah, I would say that's was really one of the biggest challenges I had. Amazing. What are the common myths that you've encountered in technology? One of the most common myths I've heard, especially to be a good leader in technology and entrepreneurial environments, it's the ability to take enormous risk. I guess even that is the reason why the media even made such a big fuss about why me and my co-founders left Stanford, left Berkeley, left Wharton. It's because like, wow, these people are, the implicit message was these people were taking huge risk. But I think that it's a huge myth because I think at least what I've learned, it's the most effective leaders try to minimize the risk that they take. But the nature of technology, the nature of building a company is such that it's already so volatile. There's so many things that could go wrong, so many things that are uncertain. And so really, I feel like a leader's responsibility is to systematically de-risk, especially those critical failure points. I think one very clear example of that was when we were raising our Series A funds and we had to bring forward our timeline by a few months. And I think one of the things that we were trying to de-risk, it's essentially how can we make sure the company stays afloat and all of our team continues to get paid. It was stressful because we had our plans laid out, but then everything suddenly had to be brought forward. But I think that's really part and parcel of being a leader, which is actively looking out for what is the biggest critical failure points and then systematically trying to, to reduce and remove it. So true. I think that's so underappreciated, which is that great leaders de-risk everything systematically for the team and for themselves, right? And I think, I think that's always the huge gap between reality <laughs> and what is portrayed or commonly understood. So many people look at you as a role model in their life. Who are your role models in real life? I personally think that I've been so blessed um, to have amazing mentors who are my role models. I'll share two of them. So one of them is Alex Lin. He, he used to be the head of Infocom Investments. Now it's SG Innovate. And earlier I was sharing with you how I absolutely hated to do cold calls and the whole ego thing. Honestly, the biggest reason for that change was him. To me, why he was such an amazing role model, it's because he wasn't afraid to confront the hard truths. He wasn't afraid to, to say things that would make people uncomfortable or in fact even upset. Right? But these were the facts, these were the reality, and ultimately he was driving towards change. And that is a role model because for me, that's something I struggle with. A lot of times I care a lot more about how people think about me than perhaps the outcome itself. And I think that was one very good example 
where he just sat me down and I was like, how many calls did you make today? And I was just giving him a bazillion reasons why the cold calls didn't happen. I was working on this, I was working on that. And he just looked me in the eye and just said, that you have to make those calls. That was one of those big wake up moments for me. Recently, I am now with Boston Consulting Group. And another role model I have is Anthony Unjin. So he's a senior partner. He leads the Manila office. And one of the reasons he has been such an amazing role model, it's how he's able to really show genuine care and concern beyond the work itself. So one example, just very recently, I was working together with him for only two or three days, putting together an initial proposal. And after that, I got assigned to another project. We went our own ways and stuff. But then about two, three weeks later, he actually bothered to follow up to say, hey, thank you for the work that you did. This is the end output of what we actually presented to the client. Of course, it was radically different from what I originally sent because that was the initial drop. He didn't have to do that. Honestly, he's a senior partner. He doesn't have to circle back and say, hey, here's the deck we presented. Right? And I think just the ability to connect, to make team members feel special. And I think especially when the the disparity in the hierarchical structure is so large, right? I think that just really speaks volumes on who the person is. And therefore, is he's definitely one of my role models. Amazing. What supporter resources are available for others considering a journey similar to yours? I think one of the biggest resources um, is actually finding one or two people who you aspire to be in their shoes, I would say, eight to 10 years from now reaching out to them and, and developing a relationship. Right? So those two role models I just shared, these honestly were the people who, who have made a huge difference in my life. I think really being able to build, not too many, right? I think it's impossible to build too many. I think as many others would attest, having one or two solid mentors is probably enough to change the trajectory many times. And that's something I, I, I would personally also advocate for. In terms of reading, I really love this author, Mark Manson. He has this book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. And it's really crisp. It's really clear. It's really logical. One of the things that really struck up to me was, I think he mentioned about this. Sometimes you see at a grocery store, let's say an old granny would scream at the cashier for not accepting the coupons. And that's because in the person's life, all that really matters it's the validity of those coupons. It just struck me, right? Because it's like, how many times do I get worked up, get stressed, get upset over things that honestly don't really matter that much? So the ability to separate what's important from what's not was one of the great insights I got from him and his blog. That's great. One of your hobbies is high-intensity cardio. What do you like about that? Oh man, I would say it's just so energetic and uplifting. So I think I will disclaim it that it has to be done in a group setting. I think when you put a group of people together to do high intensity cardio, it just really creates a kind of energy where everyone is sweaty, everyone is tired, but no one gives up. Everyone keeps moving, even if it means you have to take the less intense options. And at the end of it, like, of course, you're physically tired, but I think it's really that feeling that, hey, together as a group, we did accomplish something together. And a lot of times, without using verbal cues, we were able to encourage each other to push ourselves and push our fitness levels. So for me, as someone who was a couch potato, honestly, like I would say five years ago, it was really this idea of group high-intensity cardio that uh, at least helped me to, to be fitter. You've gotten to do a lot of things after Glintz and th the achievements there. Could you share about some of the lessons you've learned since then? Yeah, definitely. Well, I think one of the big lessons I learned after stepping out of Glintz, it's really to take a broader view of things and also at the same time, be humble. <laughs> I say that because as, as someone who has been a startup founder, I think there's a certain sense of confidence and certain sense of perception that you are better and you have the ability to, to outcompete everyone else. And I think that rightfully so, right? You have to have that confidence. Otherwise, there's no point starting a company. But um, I think for me personally, the danger of that was that was my first work experience. And because of that, I used to think that because I had built a company, really, there's nothing else that's more difficult. So of course, stepping out of it helped me to realize that, hey, there's, a, there's so much more challenges out there in the world that need to be solved. There's so much more to be learned, uh, so much more to grow. And then, I would say just having the expanded view of things, it's something that it's truly different. 
So maybe one, one very specific example that I can share. It's a lot of times when I was, as a startup back when I was building Glints, our primary customer base were SMEs, right? Of course, we occasionally work with multinational corporations, we work with governments, but the bulk of our revenue and interactions were with um, small and medium enterprises. But right now, where I'm at in consulting shows me how some of the largest organizations, the largest companies in Southeast Asia works, right? And that is such a different dimension altogether that I would never consider. So I think just being able to step out and see the world in different perspectives, different lenses, is something that I've been able to experience since then. There continues to be the eternal debate about whether to go to school first and then go launch a business, <laughs> to drop out of school, to not go to school and defer that. What advice would you give to someone who's going through that debate? So I'm going to steer this concept. Honestly, I forgot where, where I heard it from. But basically, to think a bit like Tarzan, the guy who swings from tree to tree, vine to vine in the jungle. Now, the concept is simple, right? You don't let go of the vine or the tree branch that you're currently holding on until you have grabbed onto the other one. So I think one of the biggest things that just looking back on this journey, and you're not the first to ask this question. <laughs> I'm sure you won't be the last, but the advice I always give it's, the point where I chose to leave Stanford back in 2015 was when we had raised our seed round of half a million Singapore dollars. And in that sense, there was already some level of um, validation, not just from investors, but even for customers and users. And that really gave me the confidence to leave. So if you ask me to, to do it all over again, and if I hadn't had you know, that kind of traction I had, honestly, the answer would be very different. right? And, and so I think the long story short is, I think we should not see things as, oh, you should go to school or, oh, you should drop out to build a company. I think it's just a matter of what are the best options and opportunities available to me right now. And the truth is for most of the people, not everyone is able to come out with a startup and get funding at 17 or 18, right? I'm not saying that to, to say that we were, we were different, we're better, but I'm saying that they're just different times and different opportunities choosing when to and what opportunity it's truly the most important part of it right it's not so much about taking deterministic routes like oh okay i have to build a company before i go to school so i would say really just assess what's available in front of you and then make the best decision out of it looking back what do you respect most about your co-founders i think what i really respect about them it's the yeah, can do and relentlessly resourceful spirit right I think there were many times when, especially in the early days, where I just felt that things wouldn't work out. I was just telling myself, you know what, maybe this is it. This is where things come to an end. But I think what I learned from them and what I respect them the most, it's their never say die attitude, right? This attitude that we are in it to succeed and we will make it happen. There's no such thing as not succeeding. I would say that drive has definitely carried them super far, even after I've left the company. And it's still something that I still remind myself as a lesson that I learned from them. Yeah, it's amazing to see Oswald and Ng Chong really continue to advance and push the company further since then as well. Yeah. When you look at the world, you've got an opportunity to see Stanford and now you're back in Singapore and Southeast Asia. What do you feel about being on both sides of the pond? <laughs> well, I am biased. I love Southeast Asia. I think this is home. And I think more importantly, there's just so, so much untapped opportunity. So, so honestly, kind of like the equation for me was very simple, right? I didn't even bother to look for opportunities in the US. And that was to the surprise of, of quite a few of my family and friends who thought that, hey, in Silicon Valley, that's kind of like the Mecca to be in, right? But I see it differently. I see it as, yes, Silicon Valley is the Mecca, but there is so, there is kind of like, you are such a tiny fish in a huge pond, right? There's just incredible amounts of competition there, right? Whereas if you come into Southeast Asia, you see this place that honestly, I think there are a lot more problems and solutions right now. And that to me just screams opportunity. So yep, this is definitely, I would say Southeast Asia. Many startup founders must come to you all the time to ask for help or advice. What are some common themes that you often give as advice to them? Well, the first common theme, for at least for many student founders, it's, hey, do I study or do I build my company? I think we have covered that. But I think the next thing that people um, always come to ask, it's really how 
do you build a team, right? How do you build a team, especially when you are young, you are inexperienced? And I think a lot of times it's really about, number one, demonstrating that you care for the team. I think just being able to sh show the empathy, to acknowledge that, hey, I, I don't know this. I'm also trying to figure this out. I think that it's in itself super powerful. Right? And I think the second thing, it's really to lead at the front lines. Right? So being a leader is not about sitting back, thinking of a good strategy and say, hey, go execute it. It's about rolling up your sleeves and being the last one to leave the office, right? To say, let's get this done together and we'll work this out together. Glint has managed to raise money from JFDI, yeah. Monks Hill Ventures, 500 yeah. Startups, Wavemaker Partners, yeah. and so many other incredible investors. What would you say has been some advice that you would give in terms of fundraising in Southeast Asia? I'm going to shamelessly copy one of our mentors who taught us this too, which is if you ask for advice, you get money. And if you ask for money, you get advice. <laughs> so what I mean by that, right? It's, yeah, I, I, I don't know, because you also build a company. I, I think you might be able to tell me whether that's true or not. A lot of times, if you go on knocking on doors only at the time when you need money, that's probably too late in a conversation, right? The best conversations and the most fruitful ones, honestly, happen when you are not in need of money um, and when you are genuinely seeking advice for help and actually acting on it. So one of the questions that we get is how do you raise funds, especially from such an early stage without any proven experience or background? Now, one of the things that, once again, we learn from our mentors, it's when you speak to an investor, you ask them for advice, they're going to give you a couple of things to look at. Chances are most of the time people just nod their heads and then they never follow up, they never share back. But what we learned is to take that advice, write it down, execute it, experiment it, and then send an email back to the investor, right? Tell them, hey, I actually worked on your advice. This worked, this didn't work. And here's one thing in particular that you could help me out with. I think just being able to show that, hey, you're receptive, you're humble enough to learn, and you actually listen. I think that in itself is an incredible tactic that I would say that works a lot of times when it comes to fundraising. And not really because it's just a tactic itself, but it's really that, that heart, that, that attitude of willingness to learn. Let's fast forward to 10 years in the future. What is your dream day-to-day -day life? A dream day-to-day -day life? <laughs> well, my dream day-to-day -day life, one, my dream is actually to build a company, right? And actually to do it together with my wife. I, I know that sounds like some people would actually say, like, that's crazy, you shouldn't do that. But I think, honestly, both of us complement each other really well. So I'm someone who... I think it's very opportunistic. You tell me something that's, that's an opportunity right there, I, I'll grab it, I'll execute on it right away. She's more of the one who's able to think long-term, to think ahead and foresee problems. I believe we'll both make good partners. And hey, since we're already live partners, might as well just throw in one more element of starting a business together, right? How did you meet your wife? I met my wife back when I was at Glintz. Yeah, and so... It was interesting, right? Because we, we first met at the workplace and then that was when it also became a place where we, you could, we kind of saw each other at work first. And honestly, we kind of hated each other at the start, right? Because we just always conflicted. I was this guy who wanted to go and grab opportunities right at the onset, whereas she would be the one who was like poking holes, thinking of the long-term issues that are going to come up. So yeah, I would say it was anything but love at first sight. What advice would you give to people who are founders and have personal relationships to maintain and nurture? Wow. Well, that's, that's super hard, man. I, I don't think, I don't, honestly, that's something that I'm trying to figure out myself too. But I would say really being able, the funny thing is, since you asked that, right? I think a lot of times we are really good at problem solving at the workplace in professional settings, but somehow that muscle seems to just disappear when it comes to personal issues and personal problems. I think a very concrete example that I find myself um, going through at the workplace, whether it's building my company or even right now where I'm at, when people give me feedback and tell me areas of improvement, usually I, I thank them. I, I try to understand what they're trying to say and I usually try to act on it. But in personal relationships, I would say the tendency is almost completely the opposite, right? I would try to justify why I, I was right in doing so. But I think just being able to apply the same mindset in personal relationships 
has been very helpful. At least that's what I found so far. But at the same time, it's really not natural. So that's something that, yeah, even I myself am continuously working on. Well, that's amazing because it sounds like we both exited from our first companies with our now wives, which is yeah. <laughs> it's good both ways, right? Yeah. It's a priceless outcome, right? Money can buy that. Exactly. There we go. Well, it's been absolutely amazing catching up with you and thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It was awesome to be with you on this podcast. All right. See you around.